Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another episode of our knowledge series. In this session, we are going to talk about the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which is an important topic under disaster management. But before we begin, we have a request. If you have been benefiting from this initiative, from the knowledge series initiative, do let us know by pressing the like button, share your comments once the session is over, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also, if, if you have missed out the previous sessions, do visit the channel. There is a separate playlist for the knowledge series. So go back and watch all the videos to ensure that you prepare well for mains and prelims. So with this, let's start with today's discussion. We are going to talk about the Sendai framework. The Sendai framework is very, very important because this happens to be the first major agreement under the post-2015 development agenda to deal with disaster management, disaster risk reduction, and to protect the developmental gains from the risk posed by disasters. See, under the United Nations, under the United Nations, developmental programs have been launched since many, many years. Recently, the UN brought out a couple of development agendas that we refer to as the Millennium Development Goals or MDG which was launched back in the year 2000. So from 2000 to 2015, the UN provided for a development agenda framework called the MDG or the Millennium Development Goals. This was later replaced with the post-2015 development agenda that we refer to as the 2030 Agenda. It essentially is a global framework focused on certain developmental goals and it sets a specific target along with action plans for the countries to be followed. And these targets and goals are supposed to be achieved by the year 2030. These goals are also referred to as SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Agenda. So broadly, these developmental goals adopted post-2015, they are collectively referred to as the post-2015 Development Agenda. It also extends to the Climate Change Convention and the Paris Agreement. Right? So under the same framework, there was focus on disaster management and disaster risk reduction as well. And the UN adopted a global framework for this known as the Sendai framework. This framework provides a set of targets, action plan and concrete actions to be followed by the member countries so that they can reduce disaster risk in their respective countries. So that they can protect all the developmental gains they had achieved from the potential threats posed by disasters. Because as you know, any disaster, be it a natural or a man-made disaster, they cause immense damage to both life and property. They can even destroy infrastructure, including critical infrastructure. Major disasters like a cyclone or a tsunami or an earthquake, they can set back a region with regard to its socio-economic development. So it's very important to protect the developmental gains that we have achieved over the years from the impact of disasters. It's very important to prepare for a disaster and mitigate the impact of a disaster. So that is why the need was felt for a global framework to focus on disaster risk reduction. So this is how the Sendai framework was brought about and it was adopted at the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, which was held in the year 2015. It was hosted at Sendai, the city of Sendai, which is in Japan. So in this session, we are going to understand the provisions of the Sendai framework, how is it relevant for disaster management, and what, what has India done to implement the provisions of the Sendai framework. But before we get into that, you would need a little bit of background with regard to disaster management. See, prior to 1990s, disaster management wasn't paid much attention around the world, except for few countries like, let's say, Japan. Japan has always been a leader in disaster management, considering the threats faced by Japan. Apart from few countries, most countries would largely neglect or ignore disaster management. Prior to 1990s, disaster management was not seen as a part of mainstream governance. In fact, even the United Nations hadn't paid much attention to disaster management. So whenever disasters used to happen, there would be a very ad hoc approach towards providing assistance to the victims of a disaster. Governments around the world, they were following an ad hoc approach, meaning they would just react to a disaster. Once a disaster had happened, 
they would simply provide basic emergency relief and provide search and rescue, provide basic assistance and then forget about the incident. They wouldn't take into account the long-term damage that would be caused and left behind by a major disaster. From 1960s onwards, the United Nations started adopting a few measures with regard to disaster management. It would start providing basic assistance to some countries whenever there was a major natural disaster. This continued throughout 1970s and 80s, but there was never a structured response. There was no global framework as such to streamline disaster management into day-to-day -day governance. So during this period, the UN kept providing limited assistance, but this was all ad hoc. It was temporary, it was on a case-to-case -case basis. Only when disasters used to happen, the two major disasters, only then the world was responding. They would only provide basic support, basic assistance to the victims. In 1990s, however, this thinking started to change. Because by early 1990s, there was higher importance being given for environmental issues. The Rio Earth Summit, which was held in the early 90s, in itself was a landmark event. Because the Rio Earth Summit laid the foundation for the Climate Change Convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and also for the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. So all these major environment-related conventions were brought out as a result of the Rio Earth Summit. So there was greater awareness amongst countries and governments to pay attention towards environmental degradation, environmental damage, etc. Following this, the UN had declared the decade of 1990s as the international decade for natural disaster reduction. Because by this time, the frequency of disasters had gone up. The impact of climate change was already showing and global warming was pushing up the frequency of extreme weather events. So as more and more disasters were happening and as they were leaving behind a large wide impact, the UN finally woke up to the threat. It woke up to the concerns that were there. It had set up a temporary office to deal with disaster response and disaster reduction called the UN Disaster Reduction Office. But this UN office did not have a specific mandate. It didn't have a specific terms of reference through which it can work with the member countries to focus on disaster management. But after declaring the 1990s as the decade for natural disaster reduction, the United Nations finally decided to convene a global conference to talk about disaster management. This was after the Rio Earth Summit. Because by now, that is by 1993, the Rio Earth Summit had awakened the countries to focus on environmental degradation, to focus on environmental issues. So in 1993, the UN General Assembly called for a global conference on disaster reduction and disaster management. This conference took place in the year 1994, which happens to be the first world conference on natural disasters. This was the first major UN-led conference at the global level with regard to disaster management. This conference took place at Yokohama. This is how the first global framework was brought out with regard to disaster management. Then following this, in the year 1999, the International Strategy for Disaster Reduction was brought out by the ECOSOC or the Economic and Social Council, which happens to be one of the principal organs of the United Nations. The ECOSOC brought out an International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. This was even backed by the UN General Assembly and a dedicated institution was finally created to deal with disaster management, that is UNISDR. This became a permanent UN body to specifically deal with disaster reduction and disaster management. Today, this office is known by a different name. Today, it is known as UNDRR, the UN Office on Disaster Risk Reduction. It was renamed following the adoption of the Sendai framework. But before that, it was known as UNISDR. So, an institutional response was being created at the level of the UN. A global framework was being brought out. And hence, these were major developments that took place in 1990s with regard to disaster management. The first global conference on disaster management had taken place at Yokohoma in 1994. This led to the Yokohoma strategy. A decade later, another conference took place, the second UN conference on disasters at Hyogo, which brought out the Hyogo framework. And finally, in 2015, the Sendai conference was held, the third conference on disaster management, 
which brought out the Sendai framework. So these are essentially the three major global frameworks that are there with regard to disaster management. The first Yokohama conference led to the adoption of Yokohama strategy. Please note, all the three cities are in Japan. The reason is Japan was always a leader in the field of disaster management. It was even leading the global efforts through the UN. So all three global conferences on disaster management has been hosted by Japan. So the first conference held at Yokohama in 1994 brought out the Yokohama strategy that provided for 10 principles. These 10 principles, they focused on bringing about a structured response towards disaster management. See, like I said earlier, that is before 1990s, the response to disasters was very ad hoc by every country, even by the UN. There was no structured response. There was no mainstreaming of disaster management in governance. But under the Yokohama strategy, under these 10 principles, for the first time, a structured mechanism was brought out. The UN promoted the concept of the DM cycle or the disaster management cycle. The idea was to make disaster management a continuous process in regular governance and administration. Because disasters, they don't happen by chance, right? And disasters, they don't affect just a small section of, of, of people. Disasters tend to have a wide impact across entire countries or across entire regions. Disasters can happen at any point of time. They could be instantaneous. And hence, there is a need for governments to prepare for disasters and tackle the threat posed by disasters in a scientific manner. So that is why the UN promoted the concept of a disaster management cycle so that disaster management could become a continuous process. Instead of having a temporary ad hoc response when a disaster was happening, the UN promoted a proactive approach through which disaster management could become a continuous process in governance and administration. Under this cycle, under the DM cycle, three phases in disaster management were emphasized. This included the pre-disaster phase, that is before a disaster could actually happen, right? If you have to prepare for disaster management, the preparation has to start much before a disaster could actually happen. So under the pre-disaster phase, there was focus on preparedness. The UN, through the Yokohama strategy, emphasized on mitigation. It also emphasized on prevention because certain disasters can be prevented. Certain disasters can be mitigated. And you can definitely prepare for the impact of a disaster so that you can bring down the overall impact of the disaster. But this preparation has to happen in the pre-disaster phase. Then comes the during disaster phase, the second phase in the disaster management cycle. During disaster, the focus is on providing effective emergency response. That is when a disaster has already happened, the government at the national level, at the state level and at the local level should respond effectively and immediately and provide efficient response. That is to carry out search and rescue operations to provide emergency relief in the form of medical aid, food, clothing, shelter, etc. So this happens to be the second phase in disaster management cycle that is during disaster phase. Then comes the last phase that is post disaster. Before 1990s, before Yokohama strategy, this was one phase which was largely ignored and neglected. Nobody would bother about a region which was affected by a disaster after a few weeks or after a few months. But disasters, they tend to have a long-term impact. Like I said, it can erase the developmental gains that have been achieved over the years and it can set back a region by at least a few years or few decades with regard to its socio-economic development. So for the first time, the UN started paying attention to the post-disaster phase as well. And here the focus was on reconstruction, rehabilitation and recovery. Because a region that is hit by a major disaster, it might take years to recover. It might take decades to recover. So the infrastructure that has been lost, it may have to be rebuilt. The livelihoods that have been destroyed, they may have to be rebuilt. Right? So with that focus, the UN provided for special attention to the post-disaster phase where priority would be given to reconstruction, rehabilitation and recovery.
So these were the three phases that were outlined that would become part of the DM cycle or the disaster management cycle. Of course, in preparedness, that is in pre-disaster phase, there would be inclusion of technology, there would be early warning and forecasting systems to prepare for a disaster. It, there would also be preventive and mitigative steps that could be structural and non-structural measures to make a community resilient to stand up against the impact of a disaster. For example, the impact of earthquakes can be reduced by ensuring that the building standards are followed. By ensuring that all the structures are earthquake proof or earthquake resilient, you can ensure that you can mitigate the impact of the disaster. So this is what disaster management is focused on. It's focused on preparedness, mitigation and prevention through a series of structural and non-structural measures. That is by taking few physical measures to strengthen the infrastructure. By taking few non-structural measures through laws, policies and regulations so that the adequate standards are enforced and implemented to ensure that the impact of any disaster is minimized. So this whole framework of DM cycle was brought out by the Yokohama strategy. But however, these 10 principles, they were very broad. They were very widely defined. It didn't provide any specific target. It didn't provide any specific deadline to achieve those targets. But however, many countries did adopt the Yokohama strategy and the 10 principles. This was later replaced with the upgraded version of disaster management strategy known as the Hyogo framework. In 2004-2005, the Hyogo conference took place, the second conference on disaster management. And as a result, the Hyogo framework was adopted, which would be implemented between 2005 and 2015. Under the Hyogo framework, which was the successor to the Yokohama strategy, there were five major priority areas that were identified. The previous strategy, the previous approach was fine-tuned. It was upgraded and revised. Since Yokohama strategy was lacking specific action areas and specific goals and targets, this was provided through the Yogo framework. It gave attention to prioritizing institutional structures at the national and local level so that disaster risk can be brought down. The risk associated with disaster can be brought down. It paid attention to assessing and studying a threat and monitoring a threat and implementing effective early warning systems and forecasting systems so that you can take adequate preparatory steps to either prevent a disaster or you can either mitigate the impact of a disaster. For example, through, through accurate early warning, you can mitigate the impact of cyclones, right? Through efficient early warning systems, you can mitigate the impact of a tsunami. So this requires adequate investments in technology. It requires generation of real-time alerts and dissemination of these alerts to the grassroots, to the local levels. So Hyogo framework gave such specific focus and attention to certain target areas. It focused on building understanding and awareness amongst the local communities so that the community is prepared to deal with the impact of any disaster. Because see, through assessment, through hazard and vulnerability mapping, you can determine which region is vulnerable to which type of disaster. For example, the Himalayan belt of India is vulnerable to earthquakes, landslides, etc. The east coast of India is vulnerable to cyclones and tsunamis. So your studies, assessment and monitoring helps you understand the hazard, hazard and vulnerability profile of the country and based on this, the local communities can be trained. They can be provided with better awareness so that they are aware of what steps to be taken during a disaster or even before a disaster. This plays a big role in bringing down the impact of a disaster. So the focus of Hyogo framework was on reducing the risk associated with a disaster by addressing all the parameters, all the variables related to a disaster. It focused on reducing the vulnerability through specific measures. So that is why the Hyogo framework happened to be an important global framework. It provided an opportunity for governments to be prepared and to act so that they can, they can strengthen their disaster preparedness and disaster response mechanisms. Even India adopted the standards of the Hyogo framework and we brought out the DM Act, the Disaster Management Act of 2005. Because before this, just a few years before this, India took the impact of many big disasters, 
We had the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which caused extensive damage, especially across Tamil Nadu. We had the Bhuj earthquake, the super cyclone that hit Odessa. So India had taken the full brunt of many disasters. There was large scale destruction of life and property. So finally, India also started following the UN standards and we inculcated the Hyogo framework. We imbibed the same spirit, the recommendations. We provided for the implementation of the DM cycle, the disaster management cycle in India with all the steps that we discussed. And this was provided for in the DM Act, the Disaster Management Act of 2005. So the DM Act provided for a structural response and mechanism in India to deal with disaster management. It created specific institutions to deal with disaster management. It provided for establishment of the NDMA, National Disaster Management Authority, which became the apex body to deal with disasters. It provided for establishment of NDRF, National Disaster Response Force, as a dedicated professional force to provide emergency search and rescue. Similar institutions were created at the state level as well. So such a structured response was implemented in India post-2005 because of the DM Act, which inculcated the recommendations of the Hyogo framework. So now, in 2015, the Hyogo framework has been replaced with the Sendai framework. So currently, this happens to be the global framework to deal with disaster risk reduction. It, it is part of the post-2015 development agenda and it is actually in line with other related global agreements and frameworks. It is seen as an extension of the post-2015 development agenda or as we referred to it before, the 2030 agenda. It, it is an extension of the Paris Agreement of the Climate Change Convention. It could be seen as an extension of sustainable development goals of the UN because even under SDG goals, there is priority given for disasters and disaster management and also for environment protection. So the Sendai framework is in line with all these other related global frameworks and it happens to be a 15 year program, a 15 year framework for countries to implement better standards with regard to disaster risk reduction. However, these standards are voluntary. They are non-binding in nature. They are not legally binding. Countries are free to implement them. But the UN encourages every country to follow these standards because it clearly outlines the targets, the responsibilities of every institution and stakeholder, and it helps in focusing on disaster risk reduction. So under the Sendai framework, four specific target areas have been identified. This includes priority number one, that is to understand disaster risk. This requires scientific studies, assessment and monitoring so that you study the types of disasters that are hitting a particular region. This requires considerable investments in technology as well to develop the scientific basis so that you can create the hazard map and the vulnerability profile of the country. Because once you have the hazard map and the vulnerability profile, you will be able to determine which regions are more vulnerable to a particular type of disaster. So based on this understanding of disaster risk, then you can take the other three steps, which includes strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk. That is, you provide for better administrative measures. You provide for better resources to the disaster management institutions provide for capacity building, provide them the right technology, the required manpower, so that the governance machinery is prepared to deal with the impact of any disaster. Next, it requires investments in disaster risk, re resist, uh, di in disaster risk reduction to create resilience in the community. Because to strengthen the capabilities of the authorities and the institutions, to provide for capacity building, to deploy the right kind of disaster management forces, it requires a lot of resources that is both money as well as technology. So making those right investments will help in making the local communities resilient. They can cope with the impact of a disaster and that is how you can truly achieve disaster risk reduction. Then finally, the last priority is to enhance disaster preparedness. Focus more on pre-disaster and post-disaster phases so that you prioritize preparedness. Give enough attention to reconstruction, recovery and rehabilitation and inculcate the spirit of build back better. 
the idea is to provide for a commitment through which governments will focus on building back better through which governments will give attention for reconstruction recovery and rehabilitation after a disaster has happened so this is how the sendai framework provides for mainstreaming of all these goals and it has identified four specific priorities for this so it is seen as a big improvement on the previous arrangement that is the hyogo framework and the sendai framework actually goes one step ahead of the yokohama strategy and the and the hyogo framework because it is not just identifying the priority areas but it is also providing for seven actionable targets is that clear see under yokohama strategy and hyogo framework only priority areas and principles were outlined but sendai framework is one step better because it not only identifies the four priority areas we discussed but it also lays down seven specific targets with measurable parameters through which countries performance can be measured and this has to be implemented within a given deadline that is within 2030 these seven targets includes achieving a reduction in global mortality rate with regard to disasters that is to ensure that there is lower loss of life caused by disasters you have to take adequate preparatory steps and mitigative steps so that you bring down the death count you bring down the risk posed to human life through disasters the next goal is to reduce the number of people who are affected by disasters bring down the number of people who are the victims of disasters so when we say victims it's not just about physical life and physical injury it also includes the socio economic well being because disasters can affect the socio economic well being of an individual and of the entire community so second goal is to ensure that lesser and lesser number of people are affected through disasters next ensure that you minimize the economic impact of a disaster ensure that a disaster has a minimal impact on the country's gdp and finally to ensure that your critical infrastructure is protected and to minimize the risk for the country's critical infrastructure because disasters can threaten critical infrastructure like airports seaports power plants power grids etc if these critical infrastructure facilities are damaged or destroyed it will it will deal a severe blow to the country's economy and it will also set back the country with regard to its developmental gains so there is focus on reducing the risk for critical infrastructure and the other three targets they focus on increasing the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies it pushes countries at the national level at the provincial level and at the local level to adopt and implement disaster risk reduction strategies these have to be customized to suit the local context it provides for substantial international cooperation especially to help developing underdeveloped nations it pushes the developed countries to seek out better cooperation with developing nations and provide them with financial resources and technology and even with best practices so that the developing countries and underdeveloped nations can also learn from the developed nations they can inculcate the best practices and strengthen their disaster response mechanisms and finally it provides for increasing the availability and access to multi hazard early warning systems like i said early warning and forecasting is one of the most important steps when it comes to pre disaster phase for preparedness prevention mitigation early warning and forecasting is critical but this is entirely dependent on access to certain technology you will need access to advanced based technology because information generated through satellites will play a crucial role in providing early warning and forecasting alerts it will require access to supercomputing to run forecast forecasting models so a country will have will have to depend on others to access these advanced technologies especially developing underdeveloped nations they may not have access to such advanced early warning forecasting systems so the sendai framework calls upon those countries which have these platforms and technologies to share them with those countries which don't have them so that is why india has emerged as a leader in the indian ocean region when it comes to providing disaster management alerts be it cyclones be it tsunamis india has emerged as a regional leader and provides real time alerts to all the friendly nations across the indian ocean
we have abided by the Sendai framework, we have inculcated all these priorities and seven targets through our National Disaster Management Plan. India adopted this plan in 2016 and it has been revised and updated in 2019. Through this National Disaster Management Plan, India has provided for the implementation of UN standards, the standards brought out by Sendai framework and all the four priorities that we discussed, they have been brought into the Disaster Management Plan of India. This is being implemented not just at the national level by the NDMA and the central government, but it is also implemented at the state level through the state disaster management authorities and the respective state governments. There is also enough attention given at the district level, that is at the local level, because these disaster response plans, they will have to be customized to suit the local context. So this is how India is following the four priorities and the seven targets that were laid out by the Sendai framework. So as a result, India has not only aligned with the UN disaster reduction plans, but we have also improved our disaster response. This is the biggest progress that India has achieved in the last 15 to 20 years. So on this note, I would like to conclude this session. If you have any doubts, any questions, please go ahead and ask. I'll try to answer all of them. First question, is Minamata Convention originated from this framework? No, the Minamata Convention that deals with mercury poisoning, it is a separate environment related convention. It has nothing to do with the Sendai framework. Next question, what is the role of common people in disaster management? See, the common people play a very big role in disaster management. It's not just the government, the authorities and the disaster response forces which have a role. At the end of the day, it's a local community which will be affected by a disaster. If people at the local level, if they are better aware as to what to do, what not to do during a disaster, it will go a long way in mitigating the impact of disasters. For example, you should have basic awareness of what to do and what not to do during a pandemic because pandemic is a disaster. You should have basic awareness and training of what to do during a cyclone, during a fire or during an earthquake. If you're aware of the do's and don'ts, it will help not just you and your family, but you could be in a leadership role at the community level and help out the community members as well. So common man, the common people at the grassroots, they play a very big role in disaster management. Next, where is the headquarters of disaster management located in India? If you're talking about NDMA, it's obviously located in Delhi, in New Delhi. Next question, what happens if a country is unable to fulfill the commitments of the framework? Nothing will happen. Like I said, it's, it's a voluntary agreement. It's a voluntary framework. It's non-binding framework. There won't be any penalties for not following the framework. But if you don't follow, your disaster response may not be good enough, right? Because the UN has already brought out the best possible framework. By adopting these standards, you can actually improve your disaster response. So if you don't implement them, it's up to you, right? And the country has to deal with the consequences of, of the disaster. Next, uh, is this framework efficient in dealing with disaster management? Definitely yes. As of now, it has shown results, not just in India, but around the world. The implementation of the disaster management cycle, that too in a structured uh, and institutional manner, has given better response. It has helped in bringing down disaster risk. So definitely, it has played a big role. Next, uh, will climate change come under disaster management? See, definitely climate change is linked with disaster management. Why? Because climate change and global warming, it is known to cause long-term changes in global climatic and weather patterns. So this is driving up extreme weather events. In the last few decades, the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events have gone up. So that is why today we are witnessing more extreme rains, heat waves, droughts, etc. So in many ways, the climate and weather both are linked with disasters. There's a direct connection there. So definitely climate action efforts and disaster management efforts, they are linked. That is why I said the Sendai framework is in line with the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. Okay, so on this note, I would like to bring the session to an end. If you benefited from this initiative, especially from this session, do let us know by pressing the like button, share your comments, share these videos with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching.